the aqidah will be sound and correct. Why? Because the differing was small then. So every time a year goes by, 10 years go by, 20 years, as we get closer to the Yom al Qiyamah, the fitan and the, the tribulations will increase and more different will occur in this ummah. So within the ummah you will have different opinions on how to tackle different issues concerning their belief in Allah Azza wa concerning Iman. So all of these things are very important that the Muslim knows how to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah and use them as the reference point and the main source that they, where they take their either from. So here the Imam Muhammad Ta'ala will discuss a number of issues regarding this. The first of it being Allah Azza wa Jal, the first of it being the Prophet وسلم, following the Quran and the Sunnah and leaving off innovating newly invented matters into the religion, leaving the opinions of different people and disputing groups and sticking to the core fundamental principles of Islam. Before we begin the book, inshallah, we will do a short introduction regarding the sources the Muslim takes their belief from. So all of these problems that we have in the world, whether it's issues that directly affect our Iman, our belief concerning Allah, whether they are substitute issues like things like uh, things like for example, a person not believing in the angels, things like not believing in the hereafter, things like denying and negating the attributes or the names of Allah, all of this stem from one problem, and that is when a person leaves off the Quran or the Sunnah or they don't use them as their main source that they refer back to. The problems the worldly affairs or the problems that occur within the Ummah, the calamities that befall them, such as the problems we have in Palestine for a long time, also stem from these things. By that I mean the enemies of Islam will attack the Muslims because of their Iman and because of their belief and because they hold tight onto the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet and these disbelievers will never be pleased with the Muslim sticking to their religion. And Allah Azza wa tells us that in the Quran. Only when you give up your religion and you submit and you surrender to their will, then they will leave you alone. But even then, they will still treat you as a second class citizen. So all of these problems occur from this problem and they stem from this problem and the root cause is that the Muslim is being fought from within Islam by various groups that attribute themselves to Islam but in fact they have nothing to do with Islam some, uh, a lot of the times but also from outside uh, problems from outsiders like what's happening in a lot of uh, in a lot of the Muslim countries so number one, the Muslim takes their aqidah from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, the authentic Sunnah. Number two, the early generations were upon the Quran and the Sunnah, meaning the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, They never disregarded an ayah or a hadith concerning their belief in Allah, in the hereafter, in the Mizan, in the uh, how, in the the seeing of Allah Azza wa in the hereafter, the coming down of Allah Azza wa Allah des descending on the third part of every night, until a problem came. So this problem now arise when Islam began to spread to different lands. So we said that the Sahaba, the those who came after them, the, the early generations, the Tabi'i, those who came after them. The three golden generations, they were upon the clear path. They worshipped Allah with insight and with clarity, and they knew where to take their religion from. 
Never did they question something which Allah had commanded them in the Quran. Or the Prophet ﷺ narrated. They always took it as it is, without going into details and asking why and how and if and but. Then after that, as Islam began to spread to different lands and the Muslims had conquered different cities and different countries, a lot of the problems that came were to do with Aqidah or with the creed of the Muslim. A lot of enemies had infiltrated into Islam and they had behind them the Greeks and the philosophers and the Roman uh, ideologies and all of these things then began to confuse the Muslims and they began spreading the doubts and the confusion within the Muslims so that the Muslims uh, turned away and diverted from the correct path. And of course the reason for that is because they did not want a Muslim that sticks to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the way the Sahaba followed them. Why? Because when that differing occurs within the Muslims, some say this is correct, others say that's incorrect, the Muslims will lose their power and they will lose their might and they will no longer be able to be united and the one leader, they will no longer be able to conquer more lands, they will in fact they are on the opposite, lose lands because of their difference. They will be into different, smaller entities and they will be living under the non-Muslims who will control them from the outside. Like what's happening today after we have lost the Khilafah, the Muslims had gone through problems after problems, whether it's to do with the, finan the, the financial problems or the economy, whether it's to do with security and safety, whether it's to do with the, the power and the government. So all of these problems stem from this, when the Muslims had disunited and divided amongst themselves, the enemies had taken advantage of that and they had attacked them. And remember this is something which is plotted many years ago, that a person is disconnected from the Quran. They are attacked not directly with weapons, but they are attacked in their Iman, their belief concerning Allah, their belief concerning the Prophet the Sahaba, and so on. So we said that the Muslim takes their Aqidah from these two sources. Anything else that comes after this is a confusion. You do not take your knowledge from your intellect or from the, uh, the opinions of the other people. Intellect, if it goes against the Quran or the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it should be left at, and a person should always stick to the Quran and the Sunnah. You cannot use your intellect to guess what is right. You cannot think because people's minds differ and every person has a different intellect. What I see to be correct may not look right to you. What you see to be the correct opinion, I will see it as something unacceptable. So therefore this has, does not have an ending. And the Muslim should always be careful when it comes to uh, giving precedence to the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ over their opinions or their minds or their thinking or their ideology. And that's why Allah says, وَمَا كَانِ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ There is no question for the Muslim. So therefore, Allah Azza wa Jal had sent the Prophet ﷺ with clear guidance and that the Prophet ﷺ before Islam, of course people were in confusion and were in a lot of uh, misery and problems and chaos and that affected their worldly affairs as well. Not only their religion, but it affected their worldly affairs. Allah promises that He will send a reviver within this woman. And this comes in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which we will quote shortly. Allah will send a reviver, a scholar, who will call people back to their clear guidance. Every error. 
when there is disputes and problems and people are going through uh, difficulties and they are confused and they don't know who to take from all of these conflicting opinions are taking over them Allah will send a scholar that will reignite the or be a driving force for them to come back to this to the true clear guidance of the Prophet and that's why the Prophet says in this authentic hadith this knowledge will be carried on by a just trustworthy person or people in every era when one passes away others will be sent by Allah and they will take that on what will these scholars do? They will refute the distortions of those who try to distort the texts of the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet They will also remove the corruption that the falsifiers will try and throw into this deen. And also they will clarify the, the wrong interpretations of the ignorant ones. So you'll have people who will deliberately try and misinterpret this Quran, this book, so that it can fit and it be suitable for their agenda and it will then cause a confusion. So these scholars will clarify the truth. Ibn Abi Dawud was one of those scholars. He was a scholar who had clarified this for his people and the Muslims in general, in his writings, in his lectures, in his teachings and gatherings of knowledge. After that, we will move into the, inshallah, into the book. After that short introduction and start the book, uh, a brother will read, and inshallah, we will comment on the, the uh, lines of this book. أحسن الله إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تمسك بحبل الله واتبع الهدى ولا تك بدعني لعلك تفلح ودن بكتاب الله والسنة التي أتت عن رسول الله تنجو وتربح وكن غير مخلوق كلام مليكنا بذلك دانا أتقياء وأفصح ولا Both Rahimullah Ta'ala begins with the first line and he says تمسك بحبل الله واتبع الهدى Hold tightly to the rope of Allah and the guidance. And this is, of course, in the Quran, and it's a command from Allah Azza wa Jal. And do not be an innovator, a person who invents new inv uh, matters into the religion. So this, this is an ayah from the Quran. And tamasak means step be steadfast hold firm unto it do not let it go as the prophet sallallahu alaihi said so the habl of allah the rope of allah is his quran and allah says in the quran the rope of Allah is the one that leads to Jannah and it's the book of Allah. It means follow the guidance. The guidance here is mentioned in the Quran likewise. Allah Azzawajal says that this guidance is Huda is the guidance of the Prophet. Wadeen al it is also the religion of truth. So this Huda, it comes from guidance. And guidance is of two types, as Allah tells us in the Quran, or the scholars tell us in the interpretations of the Quran. Number one is Hidayatu Irshad, a guidance where a person directs one, or a guidance where a person is directed towards something. And this is the guidance the Prophet ﷺ was sent with. The Prophet was sent with the guidance 
of Irshad. That's why Allah says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You do not guide those who you love, but it's Allah that guides them, whoever He wills. The second type of guidance, and this ayah was revealed when Abu Talib passed away. Allah Azza wa reassures the Prophet and he makes him comfortable because the Prophet وسلم, was saddened by the death of Abu Talib even though he was a disbeliever he did not believe in Allah the Prophet tried his best to make him come into Islam or to make him accept the message but it was written that he was going to die as a disbeliever <coughs> The second type of hidayah or guidance is a guidance which is hidayah to tawfiq, a guidance where Allah Azza wa Jalla gives to a person, and this is divine guidance that Allah is capable of giving to whomever He wills. This is why a person now is given this type of hidayah because of the favor of Allah. It is not because of their family or because of their uh, tribe or because of their status within society that they will have this idea. It is Allah. Allah says in the Quran. O you Muhammad will guide to the straight path. That is Hidayah to the Shad. But the Hidayah that a person is given and the guidance that a person is given comes from Allah. وَلَا تَكُوا بِدْعِيًّا لَعَلَّكَ تُفْلِحُونَ And do not be a person of bid'ah, innovator, لَعَلَّكَ تُفْلِحُونَ Perhaps you may attain success. So bid'ah, in, in its general term, it means newly invented matters. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ began his khutbah, and always used to begin with his khutbah, uh, anything that is re uh, invented and added into the religion. And a person thinks that they are going to get closer to Allah by doing this. This is known as bid'ah. Bid'ah, in its general, uh, in its linguistic meaning, it means newly invented matter or something new. And that's why from the names of Allah is Badir. Okay, Badir is Ard. It means Allah Azawajal is the originator of the heavens and the earth. So this means that a person does not uh, fall into bid'ah by leaving off the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's how generally people end up committing uh, bid'ah or innovating newly invented matters in the religion of Allah. And the author says that لَعَلَّكَ تُفْلِحُ لَعَلَّكَ has two meanings in the Arabic language. It means, here, here it means لَعَلَّكَ that you will definitely be. Okay? Like in the other meaning is that perhaps you might, which obviously is incorrect to be used here in this context. It means you will be uh, guided and you will be successful with that guidance. Once you stick to the book and the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and you avoid bid'ah as a result of you sticking to the book and the sunnah and being steadfast in that, you will be guided and you will be successful. So the success the Muslim is looking for comes from these two sources, Quran and the Hadith, the authentic Hadith of the Prophet وسلم, with the understanding of the Sahaba and the three golden generations. Not with your understanding, not according to the opinion of another person, like you always go back to these main sources and how they have been understood by the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Ta'u Tabi'een. Within the Kitab Allahi wa Sunani Allati and take, practice your religion based on the Book of Allah. So this is emphasizing again the first line and it reiterates the first line When a person sticks to the Book of Allah and the Hadith of the Prophet they will 
attain the successful in this world and in the hereafter. Allah Azza wa will give them clarity. Allah Azza wa will give them a criterion where, the, where they will distinguish, with which they will distinguish the truth from the falsehood. If a person is confused and they don't know which opinion to take, or they don't know which uh, is the sound correct belief, then this person, you have to understand, has left the main sources, the reference point, the Quran and the Hadith, and they have taken other people's opinions, which of course oppose the Hadith of the Prophet and the, the Sunnah of the Prophet. So a lot of the time, the sects, the misguided sects we have in Islam, like the Mu'tazila, the Jahmiya, the Murja'a, the Khawarij, the Shia, and others, they have given precedence to their aql and to their intellect over the Book of Allah and over the Hadith of the Prophet And they thought that, that is going to make them become guided. And the reason for that is because when a person gives priority to their aql and to their think, way of thinking of the Book, they will be misguided. And Allah promises that this person will be misguided. On the other hand, we are told that if a person follows the Qur'an the way it should be followed in their belief, they will be guided. So a person does not look left or right when it comes to the, their belief. It's one source. And there are no... There is no... There is only one correct aqidah. Okay? There is no other opinions. A person cannot have the choice to take on different aqidah when it comes to the core fundamental principles of Islam. Like the names of Allah, the attributes of Allah, uh, the Sahaba, honoring them, the hereafter, the adab al-qabr, the grave and the questioning, the Sahaba. Likewise, when it comes to Allah Azza wa Jalla describing himself in a manner that befits his majesty, there is no difference of opinions here. There is only one correct opinion. As opposed to fiqh, fiqh, there can be different opinions. Okay? The deleel in the hadith or the ayat when it comes to the fiqh and the subsidiary matters of this deen can be pulled different sides. So one per a scholar interprets it this way, Imam Shafi'i says that you can do this in your salah. The other the scholar says Imam Malik or Imam Abu Hanif or Imam Ahmed says this is the correct opinion. And all of them, of course, they can be correct. So like for example, how a person puts their hands on the chest in salah. Okay? There can be different opinions based on the hadith of the Prophet so based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the numerous narrations we received from the Prophet through the Sahaba, some say that the Prophet used to put it on his chest. Others say that he used to put it on his uh, belly button. Others say that he used to put it under the belly button. And all of them can be correct. Okay? And a person should not be told off for putting their hands here or there. Because the Yonsama is still correct. As long as you're fulfilling the pillars of Salah and you are performing the Salah in the correct manner, this, these are not from the pillars of Salah or the conditions of Salah or the things that a person has to do Salah. Like in, it's the Sunnah. The Sunnah is to put your hands on the chest, on here, above your navel, others say here. So that is fine. There can be different things on that, inshallah. Like in, your belief concerning Allah. Does Allah hear us? Does Allah see us? Does Allah come down in the last part of every night? Does Allah Azza wa Jal uh, appear or make himself visible to the creation in the hereafter? All of that cannot be uh, disputed. Likewise, a person has to understand that the Prophet himself وسلم, tells us that there will be different opposing sects within Islam. We are told that ستفترق هذه الأمة على ثلاث وسبعين فرقة 73 sets Not all of them can be correct Only one of them is correct And then they ask the Sahaba said, O Messenger of Allah Who are the saved sect? 
he said, مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ الْيَوْمُ وَأَصْحَابِي Those that will be upon what I am upon today, and those that will be upon what my companions are upon. So if you are following the way of the uh, Sahaba, the companions, then you will be saved. Okay, so that's the second line, inshallah, we will move on. And the author, Allah Ta'ala, says, Tenju wa tarbahu. When a person sticks to the book and they follow the, the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will be saved from the fitan, from the calamities, from the opposing views, from the confusion. They will worship Allah with insight, with clarity, knowing how things are when it comes to the names and the attributes of Allah Azzawajal and also the other fundamental principles of Islam. And then the author Allah says, وَقُلْ غَيْرُ مَخْلُوقٍ كَلَامُ مَلِيكِنَا بِذَلِكَ دَانًا أَتْقِيَاهُ أَفْصَحُ And say, and hold this belief with your heart, with your tongue, and say it with your tongue, but also act upon it. غَيْرُ مَخْلُوقٍ كَلَامُ مَلِيكِنَا The book of Allah or the speech of Allah is uncreated. It is not created. As some people say that it is created. The speech of Allah Azzawajal is not created. It is part of the attributes of Allah. And the dream for that is that Allah Azzawajal said, وَإِنْ أَحْرَدُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ If one of the disbelievers seeks your protection, then give them protection until they hear the speech of Allah. So Allah names it speech. And Allah spoke it. And the Quran, in its wording, in its ayat, and its, in its meanings, is not created. There are some misguided sects that say the Quran is created, which of course means that it is not part of the attributes of Allah, and that is a dangerous thing to say. From those is the Jahmiya, the followers of Jahan bin Safwan, this man, was in a state of confusion. A man came to him, and I'll tell you how he reached that level. He is the head of a sect, this kind of sect called the Jahmiya. So this man, he was upon goodness at the beginning, and then he uh, read a lot of the Greek philosophy and the, 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 the ideology of the Romans and things that Islam had nothing to do with. And then he had a doubt about Allah. Does Allah exist? A man came to him and said to him, If Allah exists, why, why, why can't we see him? And then he said, Oh, Allah, well, that's correct. Why can't I not see? Why am I worshipping something invisible? And he stopped praying. For 40 days he did not pray. He was so confused with this statement. Then after that, he denied a lot of the fundamental beliefs that the Muslims held. And of course, he was not a believer, nor his followers are believers and he was killed at the end. So this man held that opinion that the Qur'an is created. And you, you have to understand why are we discussing this? Why is this important in Aida? It's very important because when a person says that the Qur'an is created, then there will be doubt about its authenticity. If it's created, then who created it? Could it have been changed? A lot of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah went through difficulties when it came to uh, the Qur'an being created or not created. Imam Ahmed, for example, he was beaten and he was imprisoned for this, and other scholars likewise. So a person should always hold that view that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah, Allah spoke it, and Jibreel took it from Allah Azzawajal, and it was then revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu and it's not created. It is not something which a person should have a doubt about. So therefore, the aqeedah of the Muslim, of the Sunni, the one that follows Allah, and when we say Sunni, uh, Ahlul Athar, uh, Al Farqatul Najiya, Ta'ifatul Mansura, all of these terms mean the same. And they all indicate one thing, and that's following the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the first three generations. Likewise, you had others who said that the Qur'an is uh, the meanings of the Qur'an or the meanings I will read up to you the 
what they have said about the Quran. So uh, we have three different sects in Islam that say that oppose Ahl Sunnah when it comes to the uh, the Quran being created or not created. Of course, Ahl Sunnah will say that say that the Quran is uncreated and it's the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah spoke it. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah spoke to Musa directly. وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ And this is in the Quran and in the Hadith. So when a person says that the Quran is created, then that means they're doubting the authenticity of the, the Quran. The first madhab, or those who oppose Ahl Sunnah, that explicitly say that the Quran is created, is those who follow Jahl bin Safwan. Jahm bin Safwan is the man we have just uh, mentioned. Likewise, you have those who say that the Quran, I'm going to uh, stop short of saying whether well, it's created or not created. Okay, I'm not going to say it's created or not created. I'm going to be neutral. This is also incorrect. And in fact, it, it's more dangerous than the first one because then what's the point of reading this Quran when we say it's I don't know whether it's created or not created, you have a doubt in your heart about the Qur'an. And the, th the third group are those who say that اللَّفْهُ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَخْلُوق And one of them would say that the utterances in the Qur'an are created. Okay? So from the Ash'ari, for example, those that say speech of, is of two types. They say that kalam or speech is of two types. Kalam nafsi, one that is uh, we, we hold it in our hearts, we don't say it. And it's not a way of letting the, the, the words out. It's not uttering the words. And then you have kalam lafzi. Okay? A speech which is created according to them. So they divided the speech into two. Like in here, this tafsir, we have to clarify this and we have to distinguish between the two. The Quran in its meanings and its wording is not created. Okay? When a person is reading the Quran, it is not created. However, your word, your um, the movements of your tongue, your lips, that is created. The fi'il you're doing is created. However, what you're reading is not created. Okay? So if we mean by saying the Quran, uh, sorry, the, um, the words are created, if we mean the actions of the mouth, then that's correct. Like if we mean the words, the utterances, then this is not correct. So the Muslim should always be aware of that. And then Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says, وَلَا تَكُوا فِي الْقُرْآنِ بِالْوَقْفِ قَائِلًا Do not take a neutral position when it comes to the Qur'an. Okay? Do not be a person who takes no position on the Qur'an. كَمَا قَالَ أَتْبَاعُ لِجَهْمٍ وَأَسْجَحُ Like the followers of Jahm, have said. So the, the Jahmiya, this uh, misguided sect, are divided into two. Some say that the Quran is created. They explicitly say that. Others say that I'm going to avoid speaking about the uh, creation of the Quran, whether it's created or not. I'm not going to say it. Okay? So he said, وَأَسْجَرُوا And there were two lads. There were two lads when it came to holding a position. They said, it doesn't matter whether it's created or not, I will hold that position. And then he, Rahimullah Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقُلِ الْقُرْآنُ خَلْقٌ قَرَأْتُهُ فَإِنَّ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ بِالْلَفْضِ أَوْطَحُ And do not say the Qur'an is created, meaning its recitation. So we said that the third uh, opinion, or the third ta'ifa, the third sect, which opposes al sunnah when it comes to the creation of the Qur'an or whether the Qur'an is not created or not are those who say that the recitation is created. And he, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, says فَإِنَّ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ بِالْلَفْضِ يُوضَحُ The speech of Allah is made clear through its recitation. When a person reads the Qur'an, then of course they're reading the wording and it's part of the speech of Allah and their recitation, of course, is the speech of Allah. However, their actions of their mouth or their limbs is something which is created. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amalun Allah says. 
Okay, continue. وليس بمولود وليس بوالد وليس له مثل تعالى المسبح وقد ينكر الجحمي هذا وعندنا بمساق ما كنا حديث مصبح رواه so this is a continuation of the 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 second the first sifat of the Quran in creator Uh, before we go into that, we will again summarize the different positions held when it comes to the Quran or regarding the Book of Allah, the speech of Allah. We said that three different sects have deviated in this regard. Number one, they are the Jahmiyyah who say that the Quran is created. Okay, and they say that Allah does not speak. Why are they running away from this? Why are they saying uh, the Quran is not? is created and Allah doesn't speak because they say that when we say Allah speaks we're likening Allah to his creation we're resembling Allah to his creation so in order to avoid that and that's of course a nuts, it's a deficiency when Allah speaks like the human beings do we have to avoid that okay so here there's one thing we need to clarify number one the Muslim has to have four things or they have to avoid four things when it comes to the Book of Allah and the Surah of the Prophet and reading the texts. Number one, we do not do what's known as ta'deem, denying or negating the attributes of Allah. Ta'deem is to deny or say it does not exist or negate. Okay? So some of the sects have fallen into that. Like the Jahmiyyah now, they say Allah doesn't speak at all, Allah does not see. Allah does not hear, Allah does not have hands, all of that. So if a person is ma'doom, void of any of these attributes, then that means this thing does not exist. So that's why the scholars have declared them to be disbelievers. The second group are those, that the second thing that the Muslim or the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah is based upon is that they do not do Tahrif of the wordings or the statements of the Quran and the Hadith. Tahrif is to distort the meaning and give it a meaning Allah did not intend. So, for example, Allah says, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًا صَفًا Your Lord will come on the day of judgment. And likewise, the angels will come. You don't say, وَجَاءَ أَمْرُ رَبِّكَ your, The decree of your Lord will come. Allah says, He will, uh, the Prophet says, Allah will come down. يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى إِلَى السَّنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا حِينَ يَبْقَى ثُلُثُ اللَّيْلِ الْأَخِيرِ فَيَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ سَائِلٍ فَأُعْطِيَ هَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرَ لَهُ هَلْ مِنْ تَائِبٍ فَأَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِ كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام You don't say Allah Azza wa Jal does not come down It's the angels that come down You don't do the tahrif of it Why are you doing this akalluf when the sahaba did not ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Why are you looking at different meanings and opposing the direct, specific, explicit text. This is, of course, the Kalluf, and it's not allowed. The third thing that the Muslim does not do, and the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah, is distinguished with, is they don't do Taqif, what's known as Taqif, asking how, how will Allah come down? How will he, um, how will the believers be able to see Allah? How does Allah look? When you're told something about Allah, then you take it as it is, and you don't, question it and of course this is again something which will open the door to many avenues and many things when a man came to Imam Malik ta'ala, and he asked him about the matter concerning uh, what was it concerning Estiwa, Allah rising above the throne Imam Malik said Asking how is a bid'ah and it's something known which is ma'alom that Allah rises over the throne. So a person does not ask how because Allah Azza wa Jal comes down or does the action he wants in a manner that befits his majesty. You cannot think of a human being when Allah Azza wa Jal speaks. 
when Allah Azza wa Jal uh, speaks in the Quran about his attributes or about his actions, the fact that he's the one that provides for us, the one that sustains, the one that manages the affairs of the servants, the one that uh, controls the world, the one that administers everything we do, the first thing that comes to your mind is uh, the human being. Okay? So just like Allah Azza wa says, Lays kamithlihi shayun. Allah, there's nothing like Allah. Nothing can be likened to Allah. This negates the tafil, which we will mention, and tafil. And this affirms that Allah sees and hears and he has attributes. The sifat of Allah, before we go into this, let me finish with the last one. The last one that should be avoided and that either by the sunnah is distinguished with is tafil, like Allah to his creation. So we said ta'adil, which means to negate and to reject or deny. Tahrif, to distort the meaning. Takif, to say how and why is this like that. And the third one is tamthil, to liken Allah to his creation or to other beings. The first thing that a person has to understand is that if they stick to these and they establish these pillars and principles, they will not be misguided. And this is why a lot of the misguided sects have fallen into their bid'ah because of either uh, distorting the meaning or denying or uh, likening a life creation or saying how and so on. So going back to the opinions held by the deviated sects concerning the Quran, we said that the Jahmiyyah say that Allah does not speak and this Quran is created. Okay. The other opinion, or the second group, say that actually uh, they they the Mu'tazila, by the way, the Mu'tazila, they differ with Ahlul Sunnah in many things, especially the Iman, for example, seeing Allah in the hereafter. So they say that uh, they attribute the they attributed to Allah. They said the Quran. We say it's Kitabullah, Kalamullah, just like Allah says. Nabatullahi, uh, Baytullahi, but we don't say it's uh, the speech of Allah or it's not created, which in fact means it is created according to them. So this is again something which opposes our either. The third one is those who say that the Quran is in Lawhul Mahfud, it's in the preserved tablet and it's been taken from there by Jibreel and then passed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa meaning that Allah did not speak it. So if a person falls into one of these three, then they're going to have a doubt about the Quran. And then inshallah we will continue and the author says And say the your Lord Allah Azza wa Jal will make himself visible to the creation openly. Again, there are those who deny uh, seeing Allah in the hereafter. From them is, of course, the Jahmiyyah, who say that Allah will not be seen. Allah, uh, likewise the Mu'tazila, they say Allah will not be seen. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, in numerous ayat, that He will be seen on the Day of Judgment. Number one, the ayah where Allah says, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٍ The people of Jannah, will have whatever they wish for, whatever that comes to their mind, anything good, all the delights and the, the, the you know, the joys, whatever the soul loves, they will have. وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيد And we will give them extra, an increase, something additional, something even better, and that's the, that's uh, seeing Allah as we It وُجُوهُ يَوْمِئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ Some faces on that day will be bright, shining, and they will be looking at their Lord. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ tells us in the hadith, in a hadith that Allah will be seen on the day of judgment. Okay? Meaning that the believers will see Allah. As for the disbelievers, they will not see Allah. They will be veiled from seeing their Lord. 
if that's for the disbelievers, then of course you can understand the believers will have the, the chance and the opportunity to see Allah. And they will have the ability to see Allah. Can Allah be seen in this world? No. He cannot be seen in this world. Musa salam asked Allah if he can see him. قال ربي أرني أنظر إليك قال لا تراني ولكن أنظر إلى الجبل فإن استقر ولكن أنظر إلى الجبل فإن استقر مكانه فسوف تراني. He was then given a challenge. He said, if look at the mountain, if that mountain stays where it is, I will make myself visible to the mountain. Then you will see me. لكن the mountain, of course, uh, it was crushed and it turned to dust. And then Musa alayhi salam uh, fainted because of the might and the power of Allah and the fact that he cannot have the ability or bear with the might of Allah azawajal. He did not see Allah. And Allah cannot be seen in this world. However, in the hereafter, Allah will be seen. إِنَّكُمْ سَتَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ الْقَمَرَ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ The Prophet says, you will see your Lord just as you see the full moon on the 14th night. When the, the moon, if you go to the Muslim countries, you will see that the moon, when it's on the 14th of the month, 14th night of the month, the moon will be very bright, shining. You don't need a light to um, walk or to move about. Allah will make himself visible to the creation, to the believers on the Day of Judgment. Like the full moon can be seen on the 14th night. So this is not likening Allah to him to the moon, but it's likening the seeing of the moon on the 14th, the full moon, to seeing Allah in here. And this is why the author says, Kamal Badu, La Yahra wa Rabbuka Just as the full moon is not hard to see, the Prophet says at the end of that hadith, La Tuba Moon of your Yeti. You not be you will not be pushing each other to see it, to see Allah Azza wa you won't be saying, move, I need to take my, uh, you know, tent to look at Allah. Allah will be visible as a wajal in a manner that befits His Majesty. In a manner that befits His Majesty. And then the author, Rahim Allah, says, وَلَيْسَ بِمَوْلُودٍ وَلَيْسَ بِوَالِدٍ وَلَيْسَ لَهُ شِرْكٌ تَعَالَ الْمُسَبِّحُ Here, of course, this is not uh, something which many or the the sects within Islam differ from. It is normally the Yehud and the Nasara and the disbelievers, those that are not Muslims, they, they oppose this view and they say that Allah Azzawajal is either born or he has children or he has parents or he has a family and then that's how they based their belief on like in the Muslims we're talking when we talk about the different sects of the opposing groups within Islam they have normally obviously haven't uh, taken this position and they have not held that belief because it's kufr, it's disbelief when a person says that Allah has a parent so the author Allah says Allah he, uh, was not born nor was he fathered by anyone he doesn't have a parent nor is anything similar to him exalted Allah Azza wa Jal and glorified he is. So Allah Azza wa Jal is man it mentions in Surah Al-Ikhlas this Tawheed. And the Tawheed that the Muslim holds is the firm belief and the core fundamental Islam in this Surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas. It summarizes who Allah is. It tells us it's very short, concise Surah, like in Allah tells us who he is. And of course, the reason for the revelation of this surah is when the disbelievers came to the Prophet and they said to him, Ya Muhammad, sif lana rabbak. O Muhammad, describe to us your Lord. How does he look? And then Allah revealed, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samit, lam yalid, lam yunit, wa bi kulluhu fu'ad. So therefore, this surah is ta'adil thumith al-Qur'an. It is a surah which uh, equals to one third of the Qur'an. I.e., when the Qur'an is divided into three, it summarizes one third of the Quran and it, it, uh, it's the Tawheed of Allah. The Quran speaks of three main topics Qisas, stories, Ahkam, rulings and legislations, and the Tawheed of Allah, 
in the hereafter, the belief that the Muslim has concerning Allah. And this, of course, is about to read all of it, the entire surah. Continue. Eight, number eight. أحسن الله إليك وقد ينكر الجهبي هذا وعندنا بمسكات ما قلنا حديث مصرف رواه جبير عن مقال محمد فقل مثل فقل مثل ما قد قال في ذاك منجح وقد ينكر الجهبي أيضا يمينه وكلت يديه بالفواضل تنفح أوكي ستوب تايم فور سكن هي the author رحمه الله تعالى concludes the beliefs and the opinions and the ideologies different sects had or they held or the positions they held concerning Allah Azza wa Jal about the Quran and he says Rahimullah Ta'ala wa qad yunkiru al-jahmiyyu hadha wa indana bi mistaqi ma kunna hadithun musarrahu so going back to the seeing of Allah okay the author brought this beat وَلَيْسَ بِمَوْلُودٍ وَلَيْسَ بِوَالِدٍ between two lines in the context of seeing Allah and the reason for that is to clarify and to emphasize that the sifat of Allah are sifat which cannot be likened to others which cannot be denied and Allah describes himself in this surah and then he goes back to speak about the, the, the seeing of Allah Azza wa in hereafter and he says that jahmi the Jahmi, the follower of Jahmi bin Safwan, will deny that. He rejects it. However, However, we have as a testimony, as a delil, as a proof, evidence uh, to the truth of what we say. We have a delil for what we say. A hadith which clarifies this explicitly, it speaks about seeing Allah. And that's the hadith we quoted earlier. This hadith, the Prophet mentions that we're going to definitely see Allah. There is no doubt about that. And we will not have uh, problems seeing Allah or difficulties seeing Allah. And this hadith is a hadith which is mutawatir. It reached the level of mutawatir. A hadith where there are numerous narrators in every part of its chain. So the hadiths that the Prophet uh, that are narrated from the Prophet are of two types. Ahad and mutawatir. Ahad is a hadith which has one narrator in one part of that chain of narration. So, for example, uh, the Prophet وسلم, says the hadith, he utters the words, Ibn Umar here is it. Uh, Nafi' then takes it from Ibn Umar, uh, from the Tabi'in. Then Imam Malik takes it from uh, his teacher Nafi' and then it reads all the way to Imam al Bukhari or the, one of the scholars who have compiled the hadith. So, this hadith, if in one part of it, or you have one person in any part of the uh, of the chain, then it's known as a hadith ahad. Okay, it's still an evidence, it's still authentic, it's still correct. Like you have another hadith, which there are numerous narrators in every chain of the narration. So, many people narrated it with Imam Malik. Many people narrated it with Nafir. Many people narrated it, many Sahaba narrated it with Ibn Umar. So it's a hadith that is mutawatir. It's very, it's, it has a large number of narrators in every part or in every level of this narration. So here uh, we have the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, about seeing Allah and it's hadith mutawatir, one that can never be denied, even if they try to distort the, or uh, reject the, the chain of narration or the authenticity. They can never do that. Why? Because if it's narrated by a large number of people, you cannot deny that hadith. So the people of Bid'ah or the you know uh, the misguided sects, some of them do not accept the hadith ahad, a hadith which is narrated by one person in any part of the chain. They say it has to be mutawatir for it to be authentic. 
اسقو دي سني دي اثري دي بحسبات فورس دي قرآن دي سنة دي اكسب دي حديث as long as it's صحيح what it's متواتر و احد we take it and it's used as a دليل اما نفتضات we have رواه جرير عن ما قال محمد فقل مثل ما قال في ذاك وتنجحوا this حديث is narrated by Jirir bin Abdullah bin Jirir, the Sahabi, known as Jirir. And it's from the words of the Prophet. And Maqali Muhammad, the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he then says, فَقُلْ مِثْلَ مَا قَالَ فِي ذَاكَ وَتَنْجَكُمْ So say what he said about that. Meaning, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, speak to his words, وَتَنْجَكُمْ You will be successful. And that's the truth. If a person takes the hadith as it is, they do not distort the meaning of that hadith or reject the narration, they will be guided and Allah will save them from the fitna and the confusion that many people, many sects, many groups have fallen into. And then after that, we have the next line, which is, of course, about the, uh, the, the hands of Allah, another attribute of Allah Azza wa Another attribute of Allah, continue. وقد ينكر الجميع أيضا. أحسن الله إليك. وقد ينكر الجميع أيضا يمينه وكلتا يديه بالفرادل تنفعه. Here is another attribute of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran that He has hands. لما Allah Azza wa Jal says لما بما خلقت بيدي. All my hands. بل يداه مبسوطة تاني ينفق كيف يشاء. Allah attributes and mentions that He has hands. لكن some of the misguided sects say that Allah does not have hands. Okay, why? Because if we say that Allah has hands, we're likening Him to His creation, and therefore we reject this. But here, you cannot deny that Allah does not. Or some of them they say that. This doesn't mean the literal hand, the normal hand that has fingers. It means the power of Allah, Allah has power. And that's of course incorrect, it's a harif distortion of the meanings. Because none of the Sahaba interpreted it this way. When the Prophet recited the ayah that the Sahaba did not say, Oh Messenger of Allah, does that mean the power of Allah or hands? They understood, they were Arabs, they understood that hands means hands. And therefore did not give it any other meaning apart from the apparent known meaning. So therefore the Muslim takes the, uh, the ayat and the hadith concerning the sifat and the names of Allah the way it is without questioning and without distorting or negating or likening them to the creation. And then he says Rahimullah Ta'ala وَكِلْ تَعْيَدَيْهِ بِالْفَوَادِلِ تَنْفَهُ Both of the hands of Allah are his right hands. Okay, because if we say that Allah has a left hand and a right hand, then of course that's deficiency, it's a weakness, it is something not befitting for the Most High, because their left hand is weaker, okay, therefore both of his hands are right, and he says, Both of his hands give out, they sustain, they provide, and they give out all types of bounties to the creation and Allah Azza wa Jal is the most high and he is the one that gives with his hand. Likewise, he mentions in another ayah that Allah Azza wa Jal, the Yehud say, Yadu Allahi Maghlula, the hand of Allah is restricted, meaning Allah does not give, Waliyad Billah, but Allah says, Bal yada huma bisultatani yum fi uqi fiisha. Allah, his hands are Mabsudatan, they are expanded, meaning they give out a lot. Allah does not give, uh, does not get tired of giving, and He gives to whomever He wills, anyone that begs Him, as long as they show their need and their, uh, they need to Allah. Azzawajal. Continue. Okay. وقل ينزل الجبار في كل ليلة بلا كيف جنب واحد متمدح بلا طبق الدنيا يمن في بفضله 
This hadith again is about all this debate or stanza or the line of the poem is about Allah coming down. Allah tells us that He comes down. The Prophet tells us that He descends uh, to the lowest heaven in every night. And therefore, He says, Is there anyone who is in need of being given? Anyone who wants to be forgiven? Anyone who seeks to be forgiven? Anyone who wants to ask and I should give what they have asked for? And some people denied that. They said that Allah does not come down. Others say that the amr of Allah, the decree of Allah, the angels come down. And that's of course incorrect. And from those who say that Allah does not come down, are the Jahmi, of course, likewise the Mu'tazila and the Sha'ira, that they say that Allah doesn't come down because if we say that He comes down, then that's a deficiency in him, so they have denied that. Some have distorted the meaning and said that Allah doesn't come down, it's his angels that come down. And the author says, Bila kayfa jannal wahidul mutamiddihum. Okay, I think we have missed one. No, that's correct. So Allah Azawajal comes down to the lowest heaven and He grants His bounties and His blessings to whomever He wills. And He says, Bila kayfa, Bila kayfa jalla al-wahidul mutamiddihu. Without asking how magnificent is Allah Azawajal, the, the one that's most worthy of praise. And it is Allah that tells us that he will come down and the Prophet telling uh, us that Allah Azawajal comes down so therefore the Muslim should take it as it is and beg Allah and use that as an opportunity to seize that chance to ask Allah for forgiveness and to ask him for guidance because when you are told to do something instead of asking how you take it believe it as it is but also raise your hands and seize that opportunity then after that, إِلَىٰ طَبَقِ الدُّنْيَا يَمُدُّ بِفَضْلِهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, He comes down to, the, the author of Allah says, إِلَىٰ طَبَقِ الدُّنْيَا Down to the lowest heaven, يَمُنُّ بِفَضْلِهِ He gives his bounties and he grants his favors to whomever he wills with his grace and from his grace. يَمُنُّ بِفَضْلِهِ فَتُفْرَجُ أَبْوَابِ السَّمَاءِ وَتُفْتَقُوا So the gates of the heavens will be open wide and they will be spread and Allah will give to whomever he was. This is to uh, emphasize on the importance of what Allah will give a person when they ask for that. Allah will say, is there anyone who wants to be forgiven? Anyone seek forgiveness and I will forgive them. Anyone seeking forgiveness and they will meet a forgiver, one that's most forgiving, Yelqa Rafiran, they will meet the most forgiving, or anyone seeking the bounties of Allah, wa mustamnihun khayran wa rizban anyone seeking for goodness, for blessings, for provisions, for whatever they want to have, so that that person could be given what they have asked for, fayumnakum. رواه ذاك قوم لا يرد حديثهم على خاب قوم كذبوهم وقبحوهم. This is narrated by a large group of reporters, transmitters who have transmitted this hadith from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So again, it's a hadith متواتر, and therefore the Muslim accepts whatever comes from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and whether it's a hadith or متواتر does not matter. We accept it and we take it. And the Prophet ﷺ then says that Allah Azza wa Jalla will descend, of course, in a manner that befits His Majesty. So at the end of the Hadith tells us that Allah will say, "Ala mustaghfir, 
من يستغفرني فاغفر له and Allah Azza wa Jalla will continue من من يسألني فأعطيه so this is now taken from that hadith ألا مستغفر فألا مستغفر يلقى غافرا ومستمتع خيرا ويمنعه so this hadith again as we said it's narrated by Allah Jalla of you continue number 15 <laughs> okay, stop that. So the next thing is about the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu the belief of Ahl Sunnah concerning the Sahaba. Two opposing groups have opposed Ahl Sunnah with regards to their belief concerning the Sahaba. Of course, we know that the Sahaba are the the flag bearers or the the those who continued to carry on the message of the Prophet and spread the legacy of the Prophet after he died and whilst he was living. So the creed of Ahl Sunnah regarding the Sahaba is very important. And two groups from the misguided sects have been lost in this regard. Number one are the Khawarij, those who came out at the time of the Prophet The Khawarij are those who, of course, when the Prophet was giving out the war booties or he was uh, dividing uh, some wealth, a man came by the name Al-Qaysa and he said to the Prophet, Ya Muhammad, Ya'dil, O Muhammad, be fair and be just in how you give out and how you uh, divide this wealth. The Prophet said, May you be destroyed, who will be just and fair if I am not? And then he warned his Sahaba وسلم, that from the progeny of this man will be people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go down their throats, it will not pass beyond their collarbones, and they will go out of the religion of Islam just an arrow goes out, just like an arrow goes out of its target. They the Khawarij, and they are those who uh, reviled Ali and Muawiyah. Okay, so Uthman عنه, was the third Khalif. Abu Bakr became the Khalif when the Prophet passed away. And then Umar became the Khalif and he was killed. And then Uthman became the Khalif and Uthman was unjustly killed. Okay, and then the Sahaba, Muawiyah and Ali, differed over the, the Khilafah. Muawiyah demanded that the killers of Uthman are brought to justice before he uh, pledges allegiance to Ali anhu, who is going to be the fourth Khalif. So they had a differing, of course the person, the Muslim, the Sunni, does not delve into these issues and say Muawiyah was correct, Ali was correct. Of course all of them have been forgiven, so either uh, concerning the Sahaba is that they have been promised Jannah in the Quran, Allah Azza wa mentions that وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ رضي الله عنهم ورضو عنهم They were pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with them and they were all just they are not oppressors or sinful some might say so this is the aqeedah the Muslim holds concerning the Sahaba so then what did, who did this uh, where did this uh, sect come out of they came out and they said both of these men, Muawiyah and Ali, are oppressors and they are wrong and they reviled them and they said that in al illa lillah. This ruling is only for Allah. Okay? They should not be differing over things that are, you know, that should not be differing over. And they, they said they are kuffar. Ali and Muawiyah are disbelievers. This is what they said. And then there came the Shia opposing them. The Shia went to the other extreme and they said, Ali is reached the level of uh, lordship, is Allah. And they, uh, they labeled all of the other Sahaba, except for two or three, 
disbelievers. And say, they say Ali has the right to become the leader. So you see how one bid leads to the other, how one extreme leads to the other if a person goes against the Quran and Sunnah and they don't follow this guidance. Of course, a lot of the groups we have today, they stem from these uh, thoughts. So for example, uh, the Khawarij, the, the ones that are existing today are many in number, different names, the same ideology. So from the beliefs of the Khawarij is that they will label the Muslim a disbeliever due to a sin they have committed, other than shirk or other than kufr. A person who drinks alcohol and his has left the fall of Islam, according to them. A person commits zina and is no longer Muslim. His blood is halal for them. A person likewise uh, commits any, any sin, you name it, lies, his has left the fall of Islam. The other thing they have differed with Ahl Sunnah is they revolt, they revolt against the Muslim leader, the unjust, oppressive leader. They revolt against him. They say that weapons should be taken and you know, he's, be, he's to be overthrown and they lead the revolutions. Of course, this is not something which the Prophet approved of. He said that Muslims should be patient even if the leader is oppressive and takes their wealth and beats them as long as they are not committing kufr. And of course that kufr you have to have the need for it, okay, clear evidence. You have to have the power even if they commit kufr that you can remove them. You have to be sure that you can remove them and replace them with something, someone better. And you have to then be able to control them. So all of these are from their aqidah or from their things that distinguish them from other sects. The Shia, we said that the main aqidah is that they uh, curse the Sahaba, they curse Ali, Umar, uh, sorry, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, and Aisha, and the rest of them. Whereas Allah Azza wa tells us that these were just people. رضي الله عنه ورضوا عنه وسابقون الأولون لقد رضي الله عن المؤمنين إذ يبايعونك Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this in the Quran. And now if a person says they were unjust or they have committed, you know, oppression, that is of course something serious and they can leave the fall of Islam uh, because of that. So, وَقُلْ إِنَّ خَيْرَ النَّاسِ بَعْدِ مُحَمَّدٍ And say indeed the best people after the Prophet ﷺ are who? Muhammad, are the two companions of the Prophet ﷺ. His two deputies, Umar and Abu Bakr. These were his deputies. They have taken the leadership after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And then Uthman, وَزِيرَاهُ قِدْمًا ثُمَّ عُثْمَانُ لَرْجَهُ And then Uthman, the one according to the correct position or to the correct opinion. Because from Ahl Sunnah, there are those who say that Uthman is to be the fourth Khalif. And, uh, you know, Ali takes precedence or Ali is the third Khalif, which is no problem. There's different in that. That's fine. As long as we're not reviling one of them or saying this one should not des uh, doesn't deserve to be a leader or he's an oppressive ruler like the Shia do or the Khawarij do. Okay? Uh, like in the correct opinion is that Uthman is the third Khalif. And then we have وَرَابِعُهُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ بَعْدَهُمْ عَلِيٌّ حَلِيفُ الْخَيْرِ بِالْخَيْرِ Munjahu. And then the fourth one is after the best creation and after Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, it's Ali. Ali, the companion of goodness. Ali radiallahu an is the companion of goodness. Through goodness. Okay, so two goodnesses. Two things that are good about him is that number one, he's the cousin of the Prophet. He's the fourth leader of the Muslims after the Prophet passed away. Plus, he was married to the daughter of the Prophet. Sorry. Yes, he was married to the daughter of the Prophet Okay? And then he says, وَإِنَّهُمْ لَلْرَّهْدِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِمُ عَلَىٰ نُجُبِ الْفِرْدَوْسِ بِالنُّورِ تَسْرَحُهُ And those are the people, these are the companions, those whom we have no doubt about them, about their adala, about their fairness and justness, just, justice, about their leadership, about their knowledge of this deen. Okay? And Allah Azza wa Jal, the author, Allah says, 
they are going to be rewarded with Jannah. They will be shining, they will be on shining uh, great comments in Al Firdaus, in Jannah Al Firdaus. They will be on great shining bright comments, meaning that they will be given a lot of khair. Okay, perhaps the Sheikh or the author used Nujub, the camels, because the Arabs loved camels and they thought it was the best thing that a person can have the most valuable wealth that a person can be given. And of course, they will be roaming, roaming about in Jannah. He says, Tasrahu, these camels will be roaming in Jannah, moving from one place to the other as they wish and as they please, and as Allah Azza wa permits. And then, let me continue. Okay. These also are names of companions. So remember, the companions of the Prophet have various different grades when it comes to their uh, to their dignity and to their honor and to their level and station. So number one are the four, uh, fourth, the four Khalifs, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. And then number two, you have the Ashar al Mubashirin. After them, they're the most, uh, the most important and the most valuable and the most uh, people that Allah Azza wa loves the most. The four, the ten uh, Ashar al Mubashirin. So the four Khalifs. And then you have Sa'id, Sa'id bin Zaid, the companion of the Prophet The Prophet said, mentioned all of these ten names in one hadith. Yes. Uh, he said, uh, Abu Bakr in the Jannah, Umar in the Jannah, Uthman in the Jannah, Ali in the Jannah, Sa'id in the Jannah, Talha in the Jannah, Abdurrahman in the Jannah, Talha in the Jannah, until he counted ten names. So all of these are mentioned by the Prophet by name, and they were given the glad tidings that they go to enter Jannah. Others that were given the glad tidings of entering Jannah include Bilal, and it's uh, Others include uh, a lot of the Sahaba, Bayat uh, al those who have taken in Bayat al they've taken part in Bayat al Allah Azzawajal mentions them specifically in the Quran, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ Those who have taken the pledge of allegiance with you under the tree, O Muhammad. The Muhajirun are the most noble after the, of course, the four, uh, four Khalifs, and then the Ansar, and then those who participated in the Battle of Badr, and then those who, of course, the rest of the Sahaba. Okay? So, uh, this, these are the Sahaba. Sa'id bin Zaid, number one. Sa'ad, and Sa'ad of course is, as you all know, is Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, the companion of the Prophet So Sa'id bin Zaid was a cousin of Umar ibn al-Khattab. His full name is Sa'id bin Zaid bin Amr bin Nufayl. He was a cousin of Umar. And then you have Sa'ad, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, and Sa'ad was who? Sa'ad was a cousin of the Prophet Sa'ad. His mom was the auntie of the Prophet. And then you have Abdurrahman bin Awf. Abdurrahman bin Awf was a wealthy companion of the Prophet that had large businesses. All of them are mentioned. And then Talha bin Ubaidillah. And then you have Zubayr bin Awwam. Zubayr bin Awwam. Zubayr was a cousin of the Prophet. Okay. Zubayr bin Awwam. Not, uh, not Sa'id or Sa'id. طيب. And then we'll continue, inshallah, um, eight number. So the book has, as we said earlier, some of the copies have 40 lines. And the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, mentions in this copy three or four extra lines. And he mentions Khadija, Fatima, um, Hassan and Hussein. He mentions their nobility and their reward. And he mentions Aisha. He mentions Muawiyah. He mentions the Ansar and the Muhajirin. 
like in the copy that we're using, it doesn't have all of that. And then he mentions the tabi'in after that. He mentions the tabi'in. He mentions, likewise, Malik bin Anas, rahimahullah. He mentions uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, a great companion of the Prophet's uh, Afran. Sufyan al-Thawri is not a companion. He was from the Atbar al-Tabi'in. He also mentions uh, Imam al-Awza'i, rahimahullah. He mentions Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik. He doesn't mention Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa is not mentioned because Imam Abu Hanifa was uh, of course, is mentioned with the Tabi'in. Some say that Imam Abu Hanifa was from the Tabi'in because he saw some of the Sahab. Others say that he was from the Atba'u Tabi'in. So he's included. So he's included in that paint, although even though the author is not specifically naming. But the copy we have here doesn't have uh, some of the things I have mentioned, like Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik. Uh, we will move on, inshallah. We will aim to finish within the next 30 minutes. Okay, so the author says, speak good concerning the Sahaba. Do not say a bad way about them. Do not doubt the aqeedah, the fairness and justice. All of them are good and noble and honored in the sight of Allah and they are promised Jannah. All of them. Does that mean the Sahaba were infallible? No, they want some of them have committed sins. Like we're not allowed to speak about their sins. Okay? They were human beings, like in they have all been promised Jannah and they've been granted Jannah and they are going to be believers who will be granted Jannah and Allah is pleased with them before they even died. Why? Because of who they lived with, who they have taken from, because of the person that had taught them, because of them continuing this religion and spreading it and taking the hadith of the Prophet. So if you see a person speaking ill of the Sahaba, then you have to understand this person is either a munafiq or a person who is ignorant, not knowing who they're talking about. The Shia, the Wafid, Rawafid speak ill of the Sahaba. To the extent that they say that Aisha anha committed zina and she should be uh, flogged for that. Or she should be um, punished for that. They speak ill of Abu, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar. Whereas Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions their name, uh, the status and the great status in the Quran, He mentions that Aisha radiallahu anha is free of the evil actions that are attributed to her. In over ten ayats, in the Dina Jaya Ubil Ifqa Uspatum Mink, La Taqsibu Shabrada. Allah Azza wa Jalla defends her honor in the Quran and He says she's a chaste woman, the wife of the Prophet. And you have to understand that when a person speaks ill of the Sahaba, they're doubting the Quran, they're doubting the Sunnah of the Prophet. They're not a follower of the Prophet. Why? Because if you're speaking ill of his most beloved, then of course you're not happy with that person. The Prophet was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Who is the most beloved person to you? And he said, Aisha. And then he was asked from the man, he said, her father. So when a person now speaks ill of her father or Aisha, then that means they are reviling the Prophet And say, speak in terms of the Sahaba, speak good of them, say the best things about them, and all of them, not some of them, and do not be a person who speaks ill of them. Ta'ibu, pointing out to their mistakes and shortcomings or their faults. And you criticize them. You don't criticize the Sahaba, all of them were good. And then he said, Allah Azza wa Jinn revealed a clear ayat concerning them. The revelation spoke of their goodness and their honor and their excellence. So therefore, if you speak ill of them, you are denying the Qur'an, and you are saying Allah isn't telling the truth concerning them. 
And then he says, وَفِي الْفَتْحِ آيٌ لِلصَّحَابِ تَنْدَبُوا In Surah Al-Fatih, إِنَّا فَتَحَنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا There is an ayah which, of course, speaks the, about the Sahaba and how good they were. And this is the ayah we quoted earlier. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah is pleased with the believers. إِذْ يُبَايُعُونَكَ تَحْتِ الشَّيْعَةِ The Sahaba. Okay? And the verses, these verses from Surah Al-Fatih and the ayat point to the the goodness and they praise them and then we will move on to the next fundamental principle from the principles of Anisul Nakari Okay, stop there. Uh, this is about Al Qadr, and it's an affirmation of the sixth pillar of Iman. Al Qadr is again something which Ahl Sunnah have distinguished themselves with, with other sects and deviant groups. There are those who oppose Ahl Sunnah on this. This is why the author clarifies it here. And it's of course the foundation of the deen, like he mentions with the idi'an, uh, it's a main pillar and a core principle in this deen. So al-qadr, two opposing views against Ahl sunnah are al-qadriya, al-qadriya, those who deny the qadr, they say there is no qadr. You create your own actions. Allah does not know of anything that you do until after you have done them. Okay? These came out at the end of the tabi'i. And Ibn Umar was asked about them and he said that I am free from them and they are free from me. They have nothing to do with me. The Prophet of course uh, clarified this in, in his ahadith. Those who will deny Qadr. And then you have the opposite extreme. Those who say that uh, every person, every individual is compelled to do what they are doing. They have no free will. Okay, there is Qadr. Allah has decreed that I commit this and I have no choice to avoid it. If I kill someone then I am compelled to do so. And of course these are wrong. And the Sunnah take the middle path and they say that there is other Allah decrees and he's the one that controls the divine decree. And then he has given the human beings the will, the free will, the choice to do what they want. Like in all of it ends at the end of the day with the other of Allah. Okay? So they say that Al-Qadr, we as Muslims, and the Sunnah, believe that Al-Qadr has pillars. Okay? It has integrals. Number one is that from the pillars of Qadr is Al-Ilm. Allah knows even before this thing happens, that it's going to happen. It's written and it's there. And Allah is well aware of it. Okay? And it's, this is in the Quran. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Things that will come uh, after them and before them, before things even happen, Allah is well aware. Number two is Al Kitaba. Al Kitaba. In the local Mahfud, Allah writes that this is going to happen. Okay? So before you are even born, this is written. Okay? Number three is Al Mashia. The will of Allah. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah. Allah has willed after He has come to know and He's written it in the local Mahfud. If He doesn't will, or he doesn't wish for this to happen, it won't happen. So, yeah, there has to be a will for Allah. And then, Al-Khalq, Allah creates this action. Allah creates the action. The movements, the human beings, are uh, we're created, the essence of the human beings created, as well as the actions of the human being. Inna kulla shayin khalaqnahu bi qadr. We have created everything with qadr, with decree. So therefore, the fact that you're sat here now, Allah knew it. He wrote it and he willed that it happens and he has created the action. Okay? And then Allah says, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma Allah created you and your actions. So the actions of the human being are created. The actions of Allah, however, are not created. Allah is coming down. Uh, Allah is making himself visible to the human beings. Allah is uh, smiling. Lazujan hearing, Lazujan seeing, Lazujan speaking, the speech of the Quran, none of that is created. They're the attributes of Allah. 
And you have to remember that the attributes of Allah are of two types. You can take note of this, inshallah. The attributes of Allah are of two types. A sifat. The first uh, type is sifat fi'liyah. Sifat fi'liyah mean sifat that Allah Azza wa Jalla does whenever He wants. He speaks whenever He wants. He comes down whenever He wants. Okay? And then you have sifat dhatiyah. Sifat dhatiyah are things that Allah Azza wa cannot, cannot be detached from. Like his hearing, he, his sight, his hands, they cannot be detached from that, Allah Azza wa And these are attributes of Allah again. We believe in all of these attributes. So when it comes to the attributes of Allah, Ahl Sunnah differ with the misguided sects. So for example, the Jahmiya say Allah does not have names or attributes. He's ma'doom. He is uh, free of any names or attributes. Then the Mu'tazila say Allah has attributes, but he doesn't have names. Sorry, Allah has names, but he doesn't have attributes. And then the Asha'ira say Allah has names, and we only have had seven attributes for Allah. Al-Kalam, he speaks, he hears, he has qudra, power, he sees, and um, there's few more, seven. They only affirm seven, whereas al sunnah affirm all of the names and attributes of Allah. Okay, um, so here Al-Qadr, we said that it is a core fundamental principle of Islam, and it's not something that, even, uh, that can be denied. So the Prophet uh, Ibn Umar says that those who deny Al-Qadr are the Majus of Hadi Ummah. He named them the five worshippers of this Ummah, of this nation. Meaning, a person that denies Qadr is no longer Muslim. Okay? The, regarding Al-Qadr, be convinced. Okay, be aware that since it's the core pillar and the main pillar that combines many of the affairs of this religion, you have to believe in it. You have to be convinced and you have to be, uh, be a firm believer in it. With deen afiyahu. And this deen is comprehensive, encompassing many, many good things. Everything that a person needs in life. And then, uh, Allah Ta'ala speaks of the hereafter. وَلَا تُنْكِرًا جَهْلًا نَكِيرًا وَمُنْكَرًا He speaks of the punishment of the grave. Again, Khawarij say that there is no adab al-qabr. Okay. Likewise, the Mu'tizilis say there is no adab al-qabr. Okay. They deny the two angels coming to the person questioning them. They say, how? How is that possible? They use their intellect to negate this. They say that, you know, this tiny place, the grave, how are, you know, how is a person going to be made to sit up? The two angels come to him and they question him. So they imagine things which, of course, isn't correct when a person is uh, obliged to believe whatever that's mentioned in the hadith and the Quran and the wahi, you take it as it is without denying anything. Okay? وَلَا تُنْكِرَ جَهْلًا نَكِيرًا وَمُنْكَرًا and he says, Rahimullah Ta'ala, do not negate, do not deny out of ignorance, jahlan, out of ignorance. Because the person that says this is an ignorant person. Jahlan nakiran wa munkaran. Believe in nakir and munkaran. Two angels that will question the person. Marrabbuk wa madinuk. And who is this Nabi that was sent to you? And of course, these, these are there. Why the scholars have written works on this. The three fundamental principles, the three questions of the grave, and so on. And Nakir al Munkar will come. Likewise, the Muslim does not deny Al Hawl, the pond in the hereafter. The Ummah of the Prophet will be given a pond to drink from on the Day of Judgment. And this pond, as described in the hadith of the Prophet, the water, the water in it are whiter than the milk and more delicious than honey and the utensils and the cups that are used to drink from this are more than the stars in the sky 
and it's so big, so vast, it strips as far as the eye can see, and it is something which Allah will give to the believers. So this is the hawb. However, the hawb, only some people will drink from it. The Sunni, the person that follows the Prophet وسلم, does not innovate into this thing. The angels will start hitting some people that will try and drink from this, as it's narrated in Hadith, authentic Hadith. And then the Prophet وسلم, will shout out and say, Ummati, Ummati, these are from my nation. He will recognize them by their signs from the sujood. And then the angels will say, you do not know what they have come up with after you have passed away. They have innovated into your religion. So the Muqtada will be turned away and they will not be able to drink from that. They won't be allowed to drink from this uh, point. So you see how Bida is so dangerous that it will stop a person being saved from the hot burning sun of the day of judgment. And the Sahib of Bida, a person of Bida, will not make it over from the Bida. If a person is now committing sins, you know, evil desires, temptations, they know they're wrong, they know they shouldn't be doing this, they know this is against uh, the religion of Islam, and they feel guilty, they feel remorse in their heart. However, the Sahib al Bid'a, the person who innovates, praying, uh, making dua, supplicating to other than Allah, they won't have that remorse. In fact, they will think they've been rewarded for what they're doing. And this is why the scholars say that. Uh, Tawbah will be veiled from the Sahib al Bidah. They won't be able to make Tawbah because they think they're, they're right worshipping other than Allah, uh, committing shirk, committing bid'ah, committing things that Allah has not legislated. So it's very dangerous. A person of bid'ah does not rarely make Tawbah. Uh, if Allah wishes, they can like him because Shaitan beautifies this bid'ah for them and makes it seem as though it's something good. They don't make Tawbah often. However, from the scholars of the past who have taken the path of the Mu'tazila and maybe the Jahmiya and also the Asha'il, a lot of them came back to the Da'il of Ahl Sunnah. They came back to the, the, the um, Aqid of Ahl Sunnah. Like, for example, Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari. He was a Mu'tazili at the beginning. And then he they fell over with uh, the, uh, his his uh, stepfather who was married to his mom and also he was the leader of Mu'tazila. He took his teachings at the beginning but then he had, they had an argument and you know, they, uh, he left him. He then established this creed, the Ashari creed. And then after that he re uh, repented from that and he said that he came back to Ahl Sunnah and he said that I wish I had not entered into these things, the philosophies and you know the confusion. Likewise, uh, as you will be, a lot of the people that entered into you know Murtazila, Shariyat, Murjia, a lot of them regretted. Why? Because the end of Ahl Sunnah is very clear, easy to understand, no difficulties, no ambiguities surrounding it. Whereas the Aqidah of other sects is so difficult to understand. SubhanAllah, you know, they make things so difficult that a person will give up at the end and say, Allah, this is so difficult to understand. Here, this, the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah is clear. It's very clear, easy to understand. We shall continue. Okay, وَلَا الْحَوْضَ وَالْمِيزَانَ إِنَّكَ تُنْسَحُ Do not deny the mizan as well. The mizan is from the things that will, of course, the affairs of the hereafter on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah in Yawm Al-Qiyamah Allah Azza wa Jalla will put our deeds on a scale and if the good deeds are more than the good deeds they will, of course, will be saved if however the, the, the scales of the bad deeds is heavier that person if Allah does not forgive them and they do not die upon shirk they deserve to be punished if Allah wishes he can punish them he, if he doesn't wish he can forgive them he forgives whomever he was if a person does not die upon shirk. So therefore, the, uh, the, some of the deviant sects deny this and they say, there's no reason. Okay, why are we playing with the deen? How is Allah's religion going to get scales like the scales we have in this world and then put the deeds on that? That's mocking. This is how they've interpreted it. 
واسأل الله عن حفظ صلاة القرآن فأما من فقدت موازينه فهو في عيشة الرب. اوكي كاريم إنك تنصح الأوثر رحمه الله says uh, you're being advised تنصح means you're being advised so this uh, take this advice seriously اوكي كاريم أما قل يخرج الله العظيم بفضله من النار أجسادا من الفحم تطرح على النهر في الفردوس تحيا بمائه كحب حبيل السيل إذ جاء يذبح وإن رسول الله للخلق شافع وقل في عذاب قبر حق موضح The next one is about the aqeedah of the sunnah when it comes to where a person is going to end up in the hereafter. Some deviant sects have said that if a person dies and they enter the hellfire, they will never come out. Okay? So the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah is clear on this. If a person does not die upon shirk, they die upon sins, and they're Muslim, Allah will forgive, Allah will can punish them if He wishes, if He so wishes. Or he, for, he can forgive them. But even if Allah Azawajal punishes them and they are in, uh, they enter the hellfire, Allah will take that person out at the end. Okay, they will not live in there eternally, everlasting. That's only for the kuffar, the not disbelievers. Allah Azawajal will remove with his grace from his bounties and favor. بفضله من النار أجسادا من الفحم تطرح from the hellfire Allah Azza wa Jalla will remove people who will bend severely people who will bend severely until they become like a rotten فحم or hot coal you know when the coal bends so much it turns the color turns and it becomes small that person will be burnt like that in hellfire like in at the end Allah will take them out and the only thing that that's going to be left of the human being when they burn in the hellfire is their bone what's that bone called on their back at the end of the spine the the bone where Allah will recreate the person tailbone 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 that's the one yes tailbone okay that's not going to be burnt by the we are told in the hadith. Allah will give life to these people who burn in the hellfire in the river Al Firdaus, wherein they will regain their lives uh, with its water. The river in Al Firdaus, this is where people will be. Uh, dished into or thrown into and they will then regain their lives the body the bones the meat the tissue all of that will be reconstructed and formed again and Allah will make the human being from scratch again and the author Allah says like a seed when it's taken by, by a fruit you know the seed the small seeds if the flood takes it and you know destroys the farm and the plants and all of the plantation is gone, um, you, you 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 probably will not find that again. Like in, it wipes the whole area, it cleans everything. That flood will clean everything. So this is a likeness or resemblance to how the human being will be recreated. And Allah is capable of doing everything. What okay. The next one is about the Shafa'ah. So two people have opposed al Sunnah, two sects, two misguided, deviated sects. Or uh, people who went against the belief and the teachings of al Sunnah. Number one, they're the Hawarij. The Hawarij say that if a person dies upon sins, sinning, they die, khalas. They will be in the hellfire eternally. They will live there forever. They will never come out. Allah will not forgive them. And likewise, those who oppose them are the Murji'a. Murji'a are a group of people who say that, and these exist until today, you can find them. 
So, so a lot, uh, all of the sects you find them today exist in Jahmiya, Mu'tazila, Shaira, Maturidiya, Kullabiya, Murji'a, Qadriya, Jabariya, you find them a lot. Okay, the, the, the names might be different though. Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a, they don't change colors, they stay upright upon the skylights. Hadith of Prophet Sallallahu they believe in everything we've mentioned. From the names and attributes of Allah, from Yawm al Qiyamah, from Iman, uh, from their belief concerning Sahaba, everything to do with uh, this deed, they're clear on that. And their books are known, the books of Al Sunnah are known. Okay? Uh, the second group are the Murji'ah. The Murji'ah say that if a person you know, believes in La ilaha illallah with their tongue, sins do not matter. You do whatever you want, you will enter Jannah. Allah will not punish you for that. Your Iman and the Iman of Jibril are the same. Whether you commit sins, day and night, major, minor sins, whatever you do, you're good. Khalas. Okay? Don't judge my Iman is in my heart. You see, you hear that statement a lot? That's from the Aqeedah of the Murjiah. Very dangerous statement. Okay? The person, of course, your, if you believe in Allah, that should be manifested in your actions, your limbs, and how you worship Allah as a Okay? So, this is the second group that opposes Ahl Sunnah. And they believe, as we will see, that Iman does not decrease or increase, it stays the same. Iman, they say, is only with the tongue. Whereas Ahl Sunnah say that Iman is with the tongue, you utter the words, you believe in the heart and you do the actions. All of these things come together. Okay, it's not only the tongue that if you say La ilaha illallah, I'm Muslim, khalas. You don't pray, you don't fast, you don't give sadaqah. Uh, that's it. So, وَإِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِلْخَلْقِ شَافِعُ This is about the shafa'ah of the Prophet. Some people have become misguided also concerning the shafa'ah, intercession in the hereafter. We're told that the Prophet وسلم, will intercede. There are different types of shafa'ah, shafa'at al-Uthma and shafa'ah other than it. Different types of shafa'ah. Shafa'ah is intercession. Allah Azza wa Jal will go to, uh, the Prophet will go to Allah Azza wa Jal and will say, Oh Allah, you will make sujood to him. He will, this is the shafa'at al-Uthma on Yawm al-Qiyamah, the major shafa'ah, intercession. The Prophet وسلم, will intercede with Allah to judge between the people. The second type of shafa'ah is shafa'ah between the Muslims to allow them to enter Jannah. Okay, the first one is that Allah judges between the, the people. And this is for the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Because the, you know, that day is going to be a terrific, terrible day, difficult day for all. Liyom and Azim. And therefore, people wish that Allah, you know, takes them to account for their deeds. They don't think about where they're going to end, like in because of the difficulties and, you know, the hardship of that day. They wish to be removed from that place. The next shafa'ah is one for the muhid, for the believer. Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet وسلم, will go to Allah and ask Allah to enter the believers into Jannah. Allah, the, the Prophet likewise, has another shafa'ah and he will be able to plead with Allah to take some people out of the hellfire. And Allah will accept that. So shafa'ah has conditions. Number one, the shafa'ah has to be permitted by Allah. It has to be من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه with the permission of Allah. Secondly, the one that is the مشفّع, the one that is interceding, Allah has to accept their شفّع. Okay, not everyone can go and say I want to make شفّع. So if a person says my شفّع is going to intercede for me on the day after, then they're mistaken. Seriously. Okay, why? Because شفّع can only be granted some people. Allah has to be pleased with this person. There is shafa'a min fiya, shafa'a muthbata. Shafa'a that is allowed and one that is not allowed. The one that is not allowed is the one that is sought from other than Allah. Wa shafa'atu min fiyyatu ma kana tutlabu min ghayri Allah. The one that a person will seek from other than Allah. Okay, like a saint or a scholar, someone pious that died. Fi ma la yaqdiru alayhi illa Allah. One that cannot be a benefit or do anything for this person. وَشَفَاعَةُ الْمُثْبَتُ تُهِيَ الْأَتِي تُطْلَبُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَالْمُشَفَّةُ وَالشَّاءَ عَنْ 
it's the one that's sought from Allah, and Allah is pleased with it. وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَا يَرْتَضَى The believers will also be given shafa'ah. Lakin, of course, it's with the permission of Allah, and if Allah is pleased with that person. Okay, we'll finish soon, inshaAllah. So this is the shafa'ah. وَإِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِلْخَلْقِ شَافِعٌ وَقُلْ فِي عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ حَقٌ وَالْبَقُرُ The Prophet will intercede for the creation. This is Shafa'at al Uthman. Okay, the one we mentioned. And then the Shaykh, the Imam, the scholar, Rahimullah Ta'ala says, وَقُلْ فِي عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ And say, speak about the punishment of the grave. The punishment of the grave is true. It will happen. It is not something that can be denied. So for example, the Mu'tazila say there is no punishment of the grave. And some of the deviant groups that we have nowadays, like Hizm al Tahrir, for example, they say that there's no other than Qabr, there's no Allah, there's no question. So you see, a lot of these groups, more than their groups, take their either from uh, the misguided sense. Um, and that's the truth made clear. Muwadbahu, made clear. Tayyip, continue. ولا تغفر أهل الصلاة وإن عصوا فكلهم يعصي وكل عرش يصبح ولا تعتمد رأي الخوارج إنه مقال لمن يحواه يرضي ويفضح يرضي ويفضح يرضي ويفضح ولا تكن مرجيا بعوبا بدينه ألا إن من مرجي Okay, so the walat kufran ahla salati. So this is now judging people. Two misguided sects have been misled in this. They have deviated from the correct aqidah concerning the hukm we give a person in this world. They are the khawarij and the murjah. The khawarij said that when a person commits sin, even if they are a believer, even though they are a believer, they pray salah, they fast, they believe in Allah Azza wa any sin they commit, this person is going to end up in hellfire, they're going to leave the fold of Islam. So this is the hukum they give in this world, but also in the hereafter they say that person will end up in the hellfire. Okay? And whereas Mu'tazila say that this person has left the fold of Islam, like in the hereafter, is going to be in a manzila bayna manzilati. It's going to be in a station or place between Jannah and Hafayah. We don't know where he's going to end up. So the hukum is the same in this world between the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila. Like in they differ in the, on the ruling of where this person is going to end up. Okay? Dangerous. The Murji'a are a third group and they say that uh, it doesn't matter. As long as this person is a believer, they have Iman. Uh, even if they prostrate to a son, Class, that you still won't leave the fold of Islam. So if you're a believer, that's it, you're a believer. Okay? You're going to end up die as a believer. Whether you commit sins, minor, major, shirk, bid'ah, all types of sins. Okay? And do not make takfir of those who pray salah, even if they commit sins. Since all of them commit sins. All of them, all of the human beings commit sins. And the owner of the throne forgives and pardons and overlooks. Allah Azawajal overlooks and he forgives. And from his message that when a person commits sins, Allah forgives it, they make tawbah to them, to him. وَلَا تَعْتَقِدْ رَأْيَ الْخَوَارِجِ إِنَّهُ مَقَالُ لِمَنْ يَهْوَاهُ يُرْدِي وَيَفْضَحُ And do not believe in the creed of the Khawarij. Do not hold the belief of the Khawarij. إِنَّهُ مَقَالُ It's a statement or a position لِمَنْ يَهْوَاهُ For the one who desires it, the one who takes it, يُرْدِي يُرْدِي It will cause that person to be destroyed. It will be a cause for their destruction, destructive of their belief. And it is something يَفْضَحُ comes from فَضَيْحَ which means disgrace. That person will be disgraced when they hold the aqidah of the khawarij. 
the most dangerous sect that has ever come out because they kill, they destroy the subhanAllah, cause damage to the Muslims more than the non-Muslims cause damage to the Muslims. When you look at now, whatever, you look at the Muslim world, Khawarij has caused a lot of, even though the names are different, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Shabaab, all of these, subhanAllah, they, all they know is cause destruction. Boko Haram, you give them different names, like in the Aqid is the same. They, they kill people because of sins, major minor. Okay? And you, you only kill a person when you think you're going to go to Jannah because, of course, that's the aqidah you hold and you believe that you're going to earn a reward for this. Okay. Um, the next one is about. He revives, the author of Allah Ta'ala revives and refutes the murji'ah. Murji'ah are those who say that Iman does not decrease or decrease. Iman is just with the tongue. The person says, La ilaha illallah, they're Muslim. No sins affect the Iman. Nothing uh, will take a person out of the fold of Islam, regardless of how many sins they commit. And this is a dangerous belief. Okay? وَلَا تَكُمْ And do not hold the belief of the murji'a. Do not be a murji. Irja is to, of course, uh, not uh, take a position or to be lax, uh, flexible. Okay? Because the murji'i plays with his deen. He take, makes it a joke. He takes it as a joke. Surely the murji'a they have taken the religion as something playful, jokingly, ridiculing, mocking, you know, not serious. And then he, Rahimullah Ta'ala says, continue, 929. <laughs> وَيَنْقُصُ طَوْرًا بِالْمَعَاصِي وَتَارَةً بِطَاعَتِهِ يَمْنَاءُ فِي الْوَزْمِ يَرْجَحُ Okay, stop there. So, the, concept, the belief of Ahlul Sunnah with regards to Iman is that it, it's composed of three things. Iman is composed of three things. Number one, قَوْلٌ بِالْنِسَانِ Statements with the tongue. اعتقاد في القلب belief in the heart عمل بالجوارح the actions with the limbs these three things form Iman if one of them is missing then that's not Iman okay however uh, the deviated sects or the deviant sects say that Iman is only with the tongue it doesn't have to be in the heart or you don't have to do any actions which is of course incorrect and from those who say that is the murji'ah. The first group that say that is the murji'ah. And of course, some others follow that. Say, Iman consists of statements. Qawlun, wa fi'lun, and actions. Ala qawli nabiyyi musarrahu. According to the statement of the Prophet sallallahu musarrahu, which is clear, which is uh, explicit in its meaning. Okay? قَوْلٌ بِالْلِسَانُ وَعَمْلٌ بِالْقَلْبُ وَاَتْقَادٌ بِالْقَلْبُ Okay? When the Prophet ﷺ, when Jibreel came to him in the long hadith, he mentioned him Iman. And of course, this the hadith tells us that Iman is composed of these things. So you, you cannot remove one of them. You cannot remove the actions or the belief in the heart and restrict yourself to the tongue. Okay? Because anyone can say that. If you say that, then Fir'aun was a believer because he believed in his heart or with his tongue that there was only one God, like he denied it through his actions and through his belief in his heart. Okay? So, inshallah, we'll finish with this. Continue. We add this as well that Iman increases with good deeds good actions, things that are beloved to Allah and it decreases with sins. 
And even from a logical point of view, you can sense that in your iman. The week you read Quran, you fast, voluntary fast, you pray a lot, you pray yearly. If you go Umrah, if you go Hajj, if you give charity, your iman, you can sense that it's increased. It has increased. And you can tell from يعني, the, the way you are, you'll be motivated to do more worship, to uh, pray more salah, to give more sadaqah, to attend the masjid more, to uh, seek knowledge more. You can sense that from a logical point of view, even be, be, without reading the books or the Quran or going back to the books that speak of the Iman decreasing or de uh, increasing, and everything in life increases or decreases, nothing stays the same. Okay? The human being, their life increases, it, they grow, they uh, get old, or they increase, they decrease. Once they grow, they become weak again, and uh, vulnerable. They, everything in life increases or decreases. So this is a wrong ideology that every single person knows of course. Tayyip, continue. Uh, let me finish that and explain that, inshallah, what the author said. And it sometimes decreases with ma'asi, with the ma'asi, wataratan, and in other times, it increases. It, with obedience, it grows and it will be heavy on the scales. It will be heavy on the scales. Carry on. وَدَعْ عَنْكَ أَرَاءَ الرِّجَالِ وَقَوْلَهُمْ فَقَوْلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أَزْكَى وَأَشْرَهُمْ وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنْ قَوْمٍ تَلَهَّمْ فَتَلَهَّوْا بِدِينِهِمْ فَتَطْعَنْ فِي أَهْلِ الْحَدِيثِ وَتَقْدَحُوا إِذَا مَا اعتقدت دَهْرَ يا صَاحِ هَابِهِ فَأَنْتَ عَلَى خَيْرٍ تَبِيتُ وَتُصْلِحُ so the author Allah, gives an advice to the person who takes this, uh, these points that are mentioned in the book and it says leave off the opinions of men of the other others the statements of the prophet the hadith of the prophet وسلم, is more azka it is more beautiful it is more um, expanding for the chest it's more Comfortable, it's more befitting. Azka, it's more befitting. It's better for the heart. Have you not expanded your heart for you? So it's more expanding for the heart, and a person will be in a tranquil state, uh, peace of mind, comfortable, uh, without any worries or problems or confusion. If they take the hadith of the Prophet the way it should be taken and they stick to it and they leave off anyone that goes against the hadith of the Prophet any statements people will say different things confuse, it, confuse you with different things leave them do not uh, you know take the word of any other be uh, being any other human being if they go against the hadith of the Prophet even if it's a scholar leave off there their statements. And that's why Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanif, Imam Malik would say that if my statements go against the hadith of the Prophet leave off my statements and throw them against the wall and stick to the statement of the Prophet And do not be from those who play with their deen. They play from lahu. فَتَطْعَنُوا أَهْلَ الْحَدِيثِ وَتَقْدَحُوا And as a result of that, you attack the people of Hadith and you revile them. People of Hadith are the Muhaddithin, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al Hanif, Imam al-Awza'i, Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik, Imam uh, Muslim bin Hajjaj, Imam... Uh, all of the Muhaddithin from the Atba'u al-Tabi'in, from the Tabi'in, from those who came after them, they know. The Muhaddithin are not, because the Muhaddithin have done a great favor for this Ummah by compiling the Hadith of the Prophet, looking at the, uh, the transmission, authenticity of this Hadith. They made their job this, they had no other profession, they always worked on the Hadith. 
Okay? The hadith, the hadith, people of hadith. If a person attacks them, then that's an attack on the religion. So recently we have, subhanAllah, a big campaign against Imam al-Bukhari and some in the Arab world were diminishing his status and reviling him and saying, you know, Bukhari, he made mistakes and he had this and he uh, was a person like this. Of course, his book is the most authentic book after the book of Allah. So if a person that attacks Imam al-Bukhari, that's a direct attack on the Sunnah of the Prophet Okay? Because when a person attacks the scholar, they are attacking their works as well. And when they attack their works, then they have an agenda. And that agenda is to, uh, of course, prove their point and say, you know, he had this stance on that particular issue and I go against him and I oppose that. So therefore, we make dua for the Mahdithi, the scholars of Hadith, those who uh, relayed the Hadith of the Prophet and conveyed it to us. They traveled far in different, uh, to different lands and left their families and they haven't eaten and some of them used to somehow sell their house in order to seek one Hadith to travel to a different land. So for example, Imam Abu Daw, uh, Ibn Abi Dawud the Sijistani was from Persia, from uh, between Afghanistan and Iran, Sijistan is that land. And he came to Medina, Mecca, Baghdad, Iraq. He went to Egypt. He traveled around the globe to compile the hadith. His father had the same job. So, the Muhaddithin, uh, yeah, they play a big role in protecting and preserving the Sunnah of the Prophet. Then he says, if you keep the belief contained within this book, what's mentioned in this book, the book consists of 33 lines or 40 lines, if you stick to it, firm hold, يعني, be firm in holding onto it, bite it with your molar teeth, then you're going to be saved. Because it summarizes the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah. SubhanAllah, very short book, like it's very beneficial. And SubhanAllah, the, the works of the early scholars is always very, very beneficial, and more beneficial than the latest scholars, because they were closer to the Prophet, to the Tabiri, to the Sahaba. They heard the Athar and the statements and the Hadith directly from those men who heard from the Prophet and those who heard from them, and they transmitted that across to us until it reached us. So Allah Azza wa has put barakah on their books, on their poems, and their treaties, and their small texts that they have authored. And we'll, with this we finish. So the author says, إِذَا مَعْتَقَتِ الدَّهْرَيَا صَحِي هَذِهِ فَأَنْتَ عَلَىٰ خَيْرٍ تَبِيدُ وَتُصْفِحُ If you stick to this and you keep this belief contained in this poem all of your life, Stick to it as long as you are alive. Be a firm believer in this. O oh, my companion, فأنت على خيرين, you will be upon goodness day and night. وتصبحو, تبيتو, وتصبحو. You wake up with khair, upon khair, and you go to sleep with khair. هذا وصلنا وصلنا على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We will stop here, inshallah, and we ask Allah to accept it from us and to make it a means of benefit for us.